Reinhold, who is uh, now helping us doing some experiments, uh, which will be done in parabolic flight. If you need more time, you can do sounding rockets, which is launched from northern Sweden. I'm coming from Sweden myself, so it's kind of something I think is fun. He also studied uh, a lot of medicine, the, the influence of space and in particular the weightlessness on the human body. And uh, partly because we learn more about how the body works that way, which we eventually can, uh, that knowledge can be used into clinical practices or new medicines. But also we want to learn how to prepare humans for going long duration to, to Mars or things like that. And we need to combine what we do in space with what you can do on Earth. And therefore we do things like bed rest studies, uh, to some extent just lay, lay in a bed for a week or, or many weeks is somewhat similar to being in weightlessness. And uh, there's another uh, Irish scientist just got a contract with ESA, Donald Gorman, who would do a study uh, on, on those lines. And uh, we can actually also do that way, we can put people in a centrifuge. And that another question, when you go to Mars, 500 days or so, how does that affect people psychologically? And to do these kind of things, we do uh, experiments like having people live in, uh, or participate in a research station, very remote. This is in Antarctica or Concordia. And they, you can only get there for about two months in the time frame of October, November. And then they are, cannot get from there uh, for a year and see how they um, do that psychologically and do some medical experiments. And a very uh, visible experiment we just uh, concluded, or at least we concluded the isolation part of it, it was called Mars 500. These six uh, gentlemen, uh, three from Russia, two from Europe, and one from China, they spent 520 days, 17 months, locked in into a uh, kind of a <coughs> mod model, a simulated spaceship uh, in Moscow. And um, we really treated it as a spaceship to Mars, space voyage to Mars, which meant that they couldn't uh, talk to people for 14 months. Because that would be so far away in reality that the signal, radio signal even, would take too long. You say the same thing, you have to wait for a minute before you get answered. So for 14 months, all the communication was done by writing things and sending it as electronic mes messages or, or the recording video messages. What was astonishing was that it came out just as happy a team as they went in. <laughs> uh, but in addition, there was uh, some hundred experiments done, a lot of them in, in the medical areas as well as psychological areas. And I'm sure we will learn a lot from, from that because they were so controlled. With it. And the final thing is that the problem in space is radiation. Uh, this part is coming from the sun and the galaxy. And it's so much that it might be a big problem when going to Mars. And to understand what are the biological effects when you get body hit by high energy, high charged bodies. We study that in uh, accelerators. This is GSI in Darmstadt in Germany. So we uh, make experiments of putting biological things there, even uh, in rats, and see what happens. So we try to learn how big is the risk. So, uh, just concluding that, uh, yes, it's a laboratory, ISS there, with great use upwards, you can study space. Uh, AMS is an experiment which just put, was put up there this summer. Uh, and uh, down on Earth you can study things, but mostly, the most unique is probably you can use it for weightlessness. And uh, this picture illustrates, <coughs> well, I think, w what you can do. Everyone knows that uh, how Canada looks like. It looks like that here on Earth. Uh, but why does it look that way? Well, if you're a smart physicist or smart, if you've studied some physics, you know why. It's because hot air is lighter than cold air. So hot air will kind of go upwards. And when it goes upwards, it will create uh, kind of under pressure, it will suck in new uh, air down here, which brings in new fresh oxygen, which keeps the uh, fire going and gives the intense light. Well, in space, in weightlessness, it doesn't matter if the hot air is light. There is no special way it goes anyhow. 
and therefore you don't get this circulation nowhere and you don't get as much fresh oxygen coming in so you get it's just spherical shape and uh, not as well as intense light and this thing that you don't get convection or circulations in, in uh, gases or in fluids with a different temperature differences or uh, other differences that you can utilize for doing a lot of science you can learn things which you cannot learn on earth and that we then can this uh, knowledge we use to, to do better things in others. In physics, in medicine, biology, technology. Uh, and uh, biology is another thing that we want to tie into this life, uh, chemistry for life. Uh, it's been found that the immune system gets decreased in space. Uh, experiments in the 80s and 90s in space lab. Space lab was a kind of mini laboratory which was put in the payload bay of the shuttle and then flow flew uh, one to two weeks in space and they did a lot of dedicated science at that time uh, but of course it's much more powerful now at the space station so there was a couple of effects shown that uh, a type of white blood cells called lymphocytes they reduced um, the activation the internal cell structure you can call it for sets Cytoskeleton, they changed uh, how it looked like, and there was some change in the signal processing, which uh, between uh, the, the cells which triggers the immune system, T cells. And now we're doing a lot of research in ICS to try to understand this better and what are the underlying mechanisms. Uh, I'm not going to tell you much about this one because I'm not special. But the cell, our main, the, the, the smallest unit in our bodies, is very complicated just by itself. <coughs> I think that's one of the things which this picture tells you. Uh, there are a lot of things in this little cell, and just a piece of it, like the, the wall here, is by itself built up a lot of things. And in the end, there's different basic molecules, chemistry. And some of these are different when they are in my field of gravity. I'll show some picture of it. Here are uh, these tubulins, which are tubes here, and the actins. And uh, for example, here are pictures which compares how it looks in uh, space, that is microgravity. Then you have a control to make sure it's really the effect on weightlessness you study, but also still having it in space, but in uh, something that's spinning, a little centrifuge which can give you then the same gravitational force as on Earth. So that's the in-flight one, you know, do also on ground. And uh, these, these can all just actins, they look different, but clearly you can see what is here. That changes how they can uh, move around, the motility. And there's another one, these tubulins, and you can again see, uh, see that this looks clearly different than here. Much more funny structure. And let's organize. And another example, also see there to the left, that these ones look clearly different. So obviously something is going on there, but really what, we, we don't know. One experiment which is really chemistry for life, that is the uh, Miller-Urey experiment. Now, how did life originate? That is still nothing we, we don't know. Uh, I think most scientists would say that somehow you have the right composition of uh, molecules and the right environment for them, then spontaneously after a while you will get the most basic uh, molecules for life. First the amino acids and then eventually maybe the DNA. <coughs> so uh, there was two scientists in the 50s already, Miller and Uray, who did this kind of experiment. They took molecules which they thought should be around on the Earth early on, several billion, mil, uh, billion years, maybe four billion years ago. And then they assumed there would be a lot of lightning storms and maybe uh, volcano eruptions and things like that. So they put it in, this looks very much like a chemical lab, right? And there's sparks in there. And then they study what they got. And lo and behold, they got uh, a lot of uh, prebiotic organic compounds or uh, amino acids, which are really the basic units for most of our uh, molecules build up our, our, our life. So, so. 
So could this work in space? <coughs> could this have happened in space? So now it's an experiment uh, we, we want to do, we do uh, which would do similar in space, and would that be different because of the microgravity, which means you have this that's what is what I said of convections, right? And it's different temperatures, so you don't have water, maybe you maybe have ice particles. So this is a setup, and we'll see if uh, we find these molecules there also. And maybe even to speculate that it might find some intermediate molecules which they couldn't find in the original experiment. Uh, to show you how you really can use the knowledge, I want to talk about this experiment or even project called IMPRESS. Uh, it was led by a guy in my division called David Jarvis, and it was not only done by ESA, it was led by ESA, but funded by the European Commission <coughs> by a proposal he made. So it's a lot of uh, institutes from all of Europe uh, participating, as you can see also, sorry, from Dublin, uh, inspired one from <coughs> And they did many things, not only experiments in, in space, but one of the crucial things was that through this rocket in, uh, sounding rockets in Sweden, which gives you up to 13 minutes of uh, weightlessness, they could measure some very fundamental properties of uh, some metals and alloys, and when they go from molten to solid form, ther thermal physical uh, properties. That was then put into models and understand better how uh, the kind of alloys and materials work. And from that they could develop new and cheaper metal, uh, methods to, to uh, build uh, things out of this uh, lightweight uh, uh, alloy called titanium aluminum. And this is now a 100 million euro industry. And it saves a lot of money, uh, it also saves uh, fuel because you build the uh, aircraft flight. <coughs> that thing we started was uh, nickel aluminum, which is a catalytic uh, catalyst for uh, fuel cells. And uh, fuel cells, hydrogen, hydrogen fuel cells, is something which might be a really future for energy carrying. Fuel cell works such that you have. Uh, you basically have a hydrogen and oxygen, and you com combine them, uh, and you get water. So it's very environmentally friendly. Basically, like, as I said, that uh, uh, rocket engine on the shuttle, but here it's on a slower uh, process. And uh, but you need uh, some catalyst to get that going. And today, one uses uh, platinum, but platinum is very very expensive. This is about well, one thousand times cheaper. So it might be some very Good future for them. These results actually made it to the front side of Nature, which is one of the most prominent uh, science uh, magazines. What's to do with climate change studies on ISS? I said we can study the Earth from up there, and uh, we, a lot of that is done by dedicated satellites, but uh, they are normally 800 to 7 800 kilometers high, and they go in polar orbit. And here we can do something different, and we do that, something different. Uh, and um, one thing, experiment which is uh, being built now, soon will be up there. What is occupying, find, occupying the same place as we earlier had this unit called ASIM, Atmospheric uh, Space Interaction Monitor, uh, which will study uh, the upper atmosphere and, and what happens there. And another one called I Icarus will be just a and a receiver on the space station and scientists are developing extremely small transmitters or the millimeter size will be put on small birds and other migrating uh, animals and the interest from that from a climate point of view is that with the change of climate which we see that getting warmer the pattern will change over migration and we'll learn uh, more about that. 